many years ago when I owned my business, I would sit down uh, every New Year's Day and I would set goals in different compartments of my life because Zig Ziglar said you should do that. So he said failing to plan was planning to fail. So I'd create physical goals. Um, I'd create uh, mental goals. I would create social goals, financial goals, and even spiritual goals. And I'd write those down. And what I learned over the course of doing that is I compartmentalized God. You see, we have those five compartments in our lives. And if we tend to just make spiritual one component of our life rather than flowing into all of it, then we got a problem. And our thirsty souls will never be satisfied. So I've got a glass here that will represent each compartment. First the physical, our body. Next the mental. Third is the social. Fourth is the financial. And then fifth is the spiritual. Now you know what's so interesting about this? Is that God said through the prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 2.13, he said, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And so what happens is that we dam the flow of the Holy Spirit, of the living water in our lives when we create these compartments and compartmentalize God right out of it. Uh, several thousand years ago, a cistern uh, was at the uh, base of a mountainous terrain and it was plastered uh, in the stone so that it would capture the water and it would sit there and they would use that water in Palestine uh, in order to satisfy their thirst. But the problem is after a while those cisterns would crack and they would leak and there would never be the flow of water. A really good example of it is the Dead Sea. See, the Dead Sea is filled with salt and nothing lives in it. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. But do you know why nothing lives in the Dead Sea? It's because it has no outlet. There is no flow. But in the Sea of Galilee, it has an inlet, it has the flow of the sea, and it has an outlet, and it provides life translated to us, we have a tendency to build cisterns. Five cisterns that we plaster and try to hold water and be God in our own lives and satisfy our thirst, but they crack and they leak and will never be satisfied. So a heavy thing here is that Jesus said, if you damn the flow of the Holy Spirit in your life, my paraphrase, if you damn the flow of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're going to be damned at judgment. If we reject the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives, then at the judgment, at judgment day, when God says who's in and who's out for eternity, we're damned, we're out. So this is heavy stuff and really something to think about and reflect on your own life. The first cistern that I'd like to talk about is the physical cistern. Um, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 that the, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The body is where flow happens with the Spirit. And uh, he went on to write in Romans uh, 12, 1 that our body should be presented to God as a living sacrifice, there's a play on words there, a living sacrifice, uh, living like that flow of water and sacrifice that I'm uh, uh, dead to my selfishness, my cisterns. And uh, uh, I've heard one, one teacher said that many of us want to 
put our bodies on the altars as living sacrifices and then we crawl right off. So he, Paul's using that imagery on purpose, a living sacrifice. Well, I would create a cistern in my life in, in the physical goals and it would be like the food I'm going to eat, the food I'm not going to eat, the alcohol that I'm not going to drink, uh, the substance abuse that I'm not going to have, and then the exercise uh, that I realized was for my own selfish satisfaction. You know, what about you? How are you doing on the food thing? Maybe you're overeating. Maybe you're restricting food. And God's saying, hey, you've built a cistern and it's not working out the way you thought it would. In fact, if that's you, I, I would just want you to realize that there's been a couple studies done um, on what guys find attractive in girls. And there's really only one body frame that guys in general find unattractive. And it's a girl that's too skinny. And I just share that with you today to let you know that God's got something better for you if you're restricting your eating. He's got a much better plan. He's designed you for something totally different. And you've built a cistern and it's cracked and it's leaking. And you're dying inside and you're dying on the outside. And it's time to allow flow to come to your life. Flow where there's an inlet, flow, and an outlet. Maybe you're abusing alcohol. Maybe you're drinking too much. Maybe your father or your mother, uh, uh, either one was an alcoholic and you don't, you don't think that you are, but you have to have that drink every night to relax. Um, maybe you've built a cistern, a physical cistern and compartmentalized God right out of it. Um, maybe you're a legalist on the drinking thing and you're lording it over others and condemning others. Maybe it's time to let God into that. Um, maybe it's a substance abuse. Uh, a smoke, a toke, a pop of a pill. Maybe it's a cut. Remember that Paul wrote, your, you, your body is not your own. It's God's. And you were bought for a world record price. Christ gave all. God gave all in Christ to buy us, to redeem us from the slavery of building cisterns. And he wants to use us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to him, to allow flow in our lives. I'd really like you to just kind of take that assessment of your own life and decide, you know, hey, do I have any problems in the physical? Uh, have I built a cistern? Do I have sex with whom I want whenever I want and it's not my spouse? Um, we really, really need to think about this. So what would it look like if you would eat, drink, breathe, and live to honor God? So I realized I was building a cistern in my physical life and I wanted to experience flow. So I did that through three W's, the Word, Worship, and Workout. I would read the Word or the Bible every morning listen to worship music while I would work out. And there was something about that uh, norepinephrine and endorphins that would create this relaxed energy in me throughout the day. In fact, it's the difference of what a day is like for me is whether or not I start my day that way and I still continue, you know, uh, decades later, I'm still doing the same thing to experience flow. So what would it look like for you if you would try word, worship, workout, all at the same time to start your day or maybe even end your day, but I recommend to start your day and uh, experience flow in your physical body and not build a cistern with what you eat, drink, any substance abuse or how you're using your body sexually for a different design that God intended. So it's not just the physical cistern, we build mental cisterns. Second Corinthians 10.5, Paul wrote, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. That we should take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. He says not doing so is pretense. It's pretending to be someone we're not. In Romans 12, 2, Paul wrote, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I love that verse. To not conform any longer. Uh, my friend Kelly Bird taught that that means to pretend. That Paul's saying when you conform, you're pretending to be someone you're not. You're, you're building a mental cistern. But you need to renew your mind in order to experience flow. So how's a cistern work? Um, we try to have knowledge just for the sake of knowledge so that we can be smarter and maintain control of our minds. Sometimes we'll just, whatever thought comes in front of our uh, eyes, we'll mull over. You know, that can be like a lustful thought or, or something that's uh, outside God's design. But Paul's saying, if you want to experience flow, then take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Surrender it to Him and have His thoughts. Renew your mind every day. And I think the best way to experience the flow in your mind is to read the Bible and have God's words get into ours. Again, the more we get into the Word, the more His Word gets into us. And so I would encourage you to do this. I would encourage you to read through the Bible in a year. I've done this for many years now. Maybe I'm pushing 20 years of reading through the Bible every year cover to cover. And it's only three chapters a day in the Old Testament and a chapter a day in the New Testament. And I also read a chapter a day in Proverbs. And it's just amazing to see how the new is concealed in the old and the old is revealed in the new. And there's flow. And that changes your thoughts. It's changed mind. So we have the physical cistern, we have the mental cistern, and we also have a social cistern. You might say, well, what's that? Well, it's where we have companions for our benefit only, whether it's marriage, family, or friends, uh, or even customers. We use them for our benefit only, and, and, and in essence, we abuse them. Uh, in Proverbs uh, 18.24, it says that a man of many companions comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. What's interesting there is man of many companions, many companions and ruin come from the same uh, Hebrew root word, and it's out of a design, building a cistern that's apart from God. But God's designed something totally different. He doesn't want a social cistern. He wants us to reclaim all of our relationships for Him. And here's what the Word says in 1 John 4, verses 19 through 21. John wrote, We love because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he who has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Isn't it interesting how love comes vertically, that flow, so that it can flow horizontally into the lives of others? What would it look like if you would reclaim all of your relationships for God, for their benefit? I think God would use you to evangelize. You might think, no way, man, that's not me. I think he would. I think the way you would forgive people, the way you would invest in people, the way you would encourage people and comfort people in relationships, I think God would use you to evangelize and disciple. It's amazing. So I'd like you to think about today, hey, is there a group I should be in maybe with my spouse, a small group in our church, or maybe we should get connected with the church? Maybe there's a gender-specific relationship you should be in and allow somebody uh, to disciple you. Maybe it's time already for you to be discipling somebody else and allow this flow to come into your life. This social flow and demolish that social cistern of selfishly using relationships for your own benefit. Bring flow. So we have the physical cistern. We have the mental cistern, the social cistern, and now the financial cistern. 
And uh, it, it's really interesting how we do this. Uh, I want to read to you in Deuteronomy what uh, God said to the Israelites, and it's in Deuteronomy uh, 8. And this, in many ways, this is kind of my story. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with his venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of the hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and, my, and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your forefathers as it is today. Now that's powerful. I remember thinking after things had gone really well for me in a season of my life financially that it was my hands. It was my ability that created that wealth. And I realized I had built a financial cistern and I had damned the flow of the Holy Spirit in my life. I wanted to keep that money for myself because I thought it was all about me that I earned it and God had nothing to do with it. Well, look what he said thousands of years ago. I could have just picked this up and understood and applied it to my life and never had to have that cistern. And I ended up losing it all. Because of this, my heart became proud and I forgot God. You see, I said that I wanted to be a Christian and become a billionaire when I was 18 years old. They did a big story on me in the Indianapolis Star when I was the youngest realtor in the nation. I was the youngest licensed auctioneer in the nation. Uh, my uh, college newspaper did the same interview. And I forgot the Christian part and just remembered the money part. And it fell apart and it didn't work out. If there's a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. You see, there's something about when we see that God is our provider, that we take that those resources and we let it flow out of us horizontally. It comes in vertically and it flows out horizontally. I'm just reminded here as I, as I share this with you that 1 Corinthians 10.4, Paul wrote that Christ was that spiritual rock from which they drank. Christ had everything to do with the funds that were coming into my life and nothing to do with it going out. And God used some people at Black Hawk Ministries to really get my attention on how to invest in people who have need. And it's both those in my agenda, everyone I'm going to meet with today, and it's also the agenda adjusters, people who are going to come in my path and might need help. But you see, we have a tendency to build a cistern called the tithe. Tithe means tenth. And we want to give God just 10 percent. I'll just give you 10 percent, God, and then I'm going to keep all the rest. I think God's got a different mindset here, that one that we can get, glean from the scriptures. And I think God wants to give, give him, God wants us to give him 100% of our time, talent, and treasure. That means with all my resources, I'm going to think about how do I honor God? It's not just writing a check and moving on and maintaining control of my own life. It's surrendering it all to God. It's honoring God in my car, in my house, um, with uh, the payments when I make them, you know, on time, hopefully, or early. It's, it's, it's realizing that on, every, on the other side of every transaction is another human being. Have you ever noticed how uh, it usually goes with the person who wants to put God in a box and just give a percentage, um, but this phrase will come out. It's just a good business decision. It's just a good business decision. That's a cistern. That's a cistern, crack cistern, leaking cistern kind of talk. Um, I've never heard anybody say it's just a good business decision who
who, who wasn't getting ready to put money ahead of a person. And you know, it's easy to do. We all have that tendency. But if, if you find yourself saying it's just a good business decision, I would ask you to consider, take it to the Spirit of God, not to me, but to the Spirit of God, and say, hey, am I putting money ahead of people continually? Because in flow, when there's flow and we see that the resources come from our provider and they flow out horizontally uh, into our relationships, we realize that there's this dependency on God and, and everything came freely from His hand and relationship trumps everything. Relationship is greater than remuneration. People are more important than profit. So we want to honor God with 100% of our resources. Well, our fifth cistern is spiritual. It's spiritual. It's limiting God to an hour a week in a building on a particular day and oftentimes in a particular style. And I want you to see what God told the Israelites in Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 9. They would recite this uh, twice a day. This is big. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The idea there is a 24-7 life with God 168 hours a week, not just an hour a week in a building uh, confined to a particular style, but honoring God and worshiping Him with our lives 168 hours a week. You know, I realized that I was even compartmentalizing God to building a cistern for a quiet time with Him. Quiet time is great, but it led to me wanting to have my entire day be a quiet time with Him, to worship God all day long to have, do life with God. And I realized, man, almost as much as any other area of my life, I had built a spiritual cistern and I had compartmentalized God and I damned the flow of the Spirit of God, the living water, into all my life. Here's what I'd like you to do, is recognize that every act is a spiritual one. Every act is a spiritual one. So I tell you what, we build the physical cistern, right? We built a metal cistern. We've also built a social cistern. And we built a financial cistern. And unfortunately, we built a spiritual cistern. But Jesus was attending the last feast of the year. It's in John 7, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. And uh, what I want you to get here there is that there were hundreds of thousands of people in the temple. This is like an Indy 500 type crowd. And uh, Jesus at the conclusion of that feast that was all about water, it was about God's provision for them, bringing the autumn rains. And Jesus, in a loud voice, at the conclusion of that feast, said this, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him, from the core of his being, from his belly, from his heart. And by this he met the Spirit, capital S, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The ultimate clarity of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit of Christ, one that was prophesied in Ezekiel and Zechariah, 
is here. And Jesus said that we will never thirst again when we fully surrender all these compartments to him. He brings flow in our life and he satisfies our desires. He satisfies our thirsty hearts. And that flow happens because Christ is the inlet and Christ is the flow and Christ is the outlet. And the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ has redeemed us from all this compartmentalizing and he satisfies us. He fulfills our every need. And so God's de designed it so it would be like this. That he would permeate everything, every part of our lives. That Christ would be our inlet. That Christ would be our flow. And Christ would be our outlet because we were created for a thirst for God and only He can satisfy that thirst. And when we compartmentalize God, we create boundaries that didn't previously exist. And, and these are cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water and they've dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Today, I'd like you to surrender those cisterns to him and allow Christ, our restorer, to bring flow to your life from the spring of living water, his spirit. Just like a collector car, each one of us needs restored to authenticity, to reflect the design of the designer. In order to do so, we need to surrender our old basket case of a life to Christ the Restorer. And we do that by saying, I can't, you can. Second, he takes us apart and piece by piece begins to restore our lives. And we are followed by a bunch of little I can't, you can's. And then finally, we surrender the new, the new tragedies, the new triumphs. On our journey on Restoration Road, we get dinged, worn, torn, tattered, and faded, and it's another opportunity to return to the one who makes things new. What about you? Are you ready to fully surrender your heart, desires, and life to Christ as Savior and Lord and say, I can't, you can. Today might be the day that you draw the line in the sand, put the stake in the ground, and fully surrender your clay heart to Him.